to travel by train along the magnificent North Wales coast from Chester to Aberystwyth is an experience never to be forgotten, with castles, cliffs, towns and beaches, and a great deal more. Our journey begins in Chester, a city on the border between England and Wales with a history that stretches back almost 2,000 years. Cheshire's county town is most easily toured on foot, but there are frequent tour buses which also provide an excellent way to take in the sights. Chester has a long and colourful history. It was founded by the Romans and is still protected by its ancient walls. The Romans named the city Diva after the River Dee. It's crossed here by a slightly more recent Old Dee Bridge. Modern shops and offices are cleverly concealed behind much older frontages. The coexistence of ancient and modern is central to Chester's appeal. Its many visitors are always delighted by the contrasts which are found all over the city. With a brief introduction from the tour bus over, the first stop is the cathedral. Dating from Norman times, it was restored as it stands today in the 19th century. But the square central tower still stands on 14th century pillars. And the north transept dates from about 1140. Inside, the choir is separated from the nave by a Victorian screen and rood. The stained glass, although recent, is magnificent. Particularly impressive is the massive west window. In the inner courtyard of the cathedral's cloisters, you can find a sanctuary of peace and tranquility from the outside world. The city walls run almost unbroken around the old centre. Though dating from Roman times, much has been rebuilt since. But the walk around the city walls is very popular. Guided tours are also available. My name's Danny Taylor. I work for Chester City Council. I'm a tour guide in Chester. I take people on guided tours around Chester and the Roman ruins. The best of the Roman remains are found next to the walls. The amphitheatre has been restored and visitors can explore the ruins. Nearby, a Roman temple has also been partially restored. Recently, the Roman street names have been revived and displayed alongside the existing ones. The castle which towers over the walls has been the headquarters of the Cheshire Regiment since Victorian times. And the castle also houses a fine museum of the regiment's history. Regimental finery from uniforms and saddles to swords and medals are all on display. Chief among them is the tribute to Captain Oates, who sacrificed himself for his companions in the Antarctic.
Chester is famous for its buildings. The diversity and contrast is striking, from Victorian extravagance to traditional black and white Tudor. There's even a modern shopping centre. In the middle of the city there stands a medieval cross, which is the hub from which all the main streets branch off. Throughout the summer, there's always something different to entertain the visitor. And amongst the many attractions are the street painters and performers. A fine race course occupies the flat meadow by the river. Occasional flooding preserved this land from earlier development. When the Romans came, they found that the Dee was both an important and sacred river to the native Celts. Even today, it's not hard to see why. The river is a major attraction. Swans and ducks, boats and dinghies, and even swimmers are all enticed to take to the water. It's time to leave Chester now and from the fine Victorian station we begin our journey out of England and into Wales. Our first stop is along the North Wales coast in Rill, a popular seaside resort with a sun centre that ensures that even if the weather is bad, you can still have a good time. High above it all, a monorail glides slowly over the complex, looking down on the wave pool and the slides. Leaving Rill, we cross the River Cloet, cloaked in early morning mist, and continue along the Welsh coast to the major railway interchange at Llandudno Junction. From here, we leave the main line and head north for a few miles to the unspoiled Victorian town of Llandudno. Pier, promenade, lifeboat and the town itself combine to create the perfect seaside atmosphere. To top it all, there is the Great Orm itself, a massive dome of limestone with a unique cable haul tramway to take you all the way to the top. Built in 1902, the Great Orm Tramway climbs the steep, narrow streets at a maximum speed of five miles per hour, with the weight of the descending car helping to pull the other tram up the hill.
Other ways to get to the summit are by a private road and cable cars. But however you get there, the magnificent view of the town and the bay from the 650-foot high rock is something not to be missed. The train takes us back to Clandano Junction, but before continuing south, we make just a short detour over the narrow estuary to Conway. Conway's skyline is dominated by the massive castle, and the regular steam trains which ply the North Wales coast add to the atmosphere of this majestic town. Conway is steeped in history, and the main street has many fine old buildings. The castle between the River Conway and the little Giffin stream was built by the English King Edward I during the long wars to subdue the Welsh. The town is still totally enclosed by its ancient medieval walls. But it's only possible to negotiate short sections of the wall because later buildings have encroached onto it. Plasma, one of Britain's finest Elizabethan townhouses, is a survivor from a slightly later period. It's recently come under the protection of the National Trust and is now open to visitors. Down by the harbour, the old fishing port bustles with life. Here, on the quayside, is a house which claims to be the smallest in Britain. There's also the chance to see the traditional Welsh costume. Fishermen still tend their nets on the quayside, but now a big number of boats cater for holidaymakers. Many different trips are available, whether you want to go fishing or on a cruise upriver. Beyond Conway, the scenery becomes increasingly spectacular. The wild Sinchnad Pass on the road to Penmanma is just a couple of miles away. Further along the coast, the beaches of Conway Bay are vast and empty. The perfect place to get away from it all. Resuming our journey, we now head south, down the Conway Valley to Talikam. This small country station is a stopping point for Bodnan Gardens, said by many to be the most splendid in Wales. The garden was developed in the early part of this century by Lord Aberconway, initially as a series of Italian-style terraces. It soon grew into enormously varied landscapes covering over 80 acres. The famous Laburnum Arch is one of the centerpieces of the garden. Windmill came from Worcester and was bought by the second Lord Ever Conway, who moved and rebuilt it in the gardens in 1938.
the bottom of the gardens is the Dell, formed by the valley of the river Hyrathlin. Bodmont Gardens is managed by the National Trust, who makes sure that the gardens will remain as cared for and beautiful for many years to come. We now travel down the Conway Valley to Hlanrust. Here the Conway River forms a natural barrier, and alongside the few bridges, typical Welsh valley communities have evolved. Cafes and shops cater for the passing visitor. But the village's first inhabitants have left a more permanent legacy in the form of this impressive stone circle. On the other bank of the river, in a setting that is just as dramatic, there are more recent religious buildings. The biggest town in the valley is Bettersea Coed, our next stop. Here, next to the British Rail Station, is the Conway Valley Railway Museum. The museum's major attraction is its steam-hauled miniature railway. This line boasts beautifully made fifth-scale working steam locomotives, lovingly maintained. There's also a shop and a buffet car where you can relax and watch the trains go by. The visitor centre is an excellent place to begin a tour of the area around Bettersea Coed. The town itself nestles amidst the mountains and forests and these impressive falls are just off the main street. Bettersea Coed caters primarily for people who like outdoor holidays. But there are also plenty of cafes and shops, and traditional Welsh crafts are available at the craft centre. For the more adventurous, there are guided tours into the mountains, and a network of footpaths spreads all over the valley. Bettersea Coed is in the Snowdonia National Park, dominated by Snowdon, the highest mountain in England and Wales, an area which has the most dramatic scenery in Wales. The ascent of Snowdon itself is not all that difficult, especially if you take advantage of the Snowdon Mountain Railway. Opened in 1896, this rack railway is the only one of its kind in Britain. Thousands of people climb to the summit every year and they're rewarded with views for miles around in all directions. But the real majesty of Snowdon lies in the arms of rock which radiate out in all directions. The next stop on our journey towards the west coast is at Dolwydechlin. 
This stretch of the railway line is not very busy, and this tiny station is quiet for most of the day. The village of Dolridechlin consists of slate houses and green fields, guarded by rock and forest, and by the foreboding presence of Dolridechlin Castle, the birthplace of Prince Llewellyn. In the village, the old school has been converted into a cafe and craft centre. Here, Paul and Gail Boyer produce hand-thrown stoneware and fine bone china, and we can watch them at work. At Blyney Festiniog, we leave British Rail and continue to Porth Maddock on the Festiniog Railway. But before travelling down the narrow gauge line, there's time for a look around the town. Blyney Festiniog is dominated by slate, and the barren landscape is an impressive testimony to the industry of bygone days. Then, the town was home to thousands of miners who cut the slate by hand from the mountains all around. A glimpse of these former times can be found at the Chlechwed Slate Caverns, where the miners' tramway allows you to tour a section of the complex network of tunnels and caverns. Water chamber, our work from above. Yeah. As I said, they, 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 if you have an angle of 30 feet, 30 feet always on that angle. Mm -hmm. so, so, so these are the drilling marks, as you can well see. They were done by, by hand, of course, by a means of called the jumper. That would be very, very hard work indeed. Later on, of course, compressed air came and made that kind of work much easier. But in the days we're talking about, it was all done by hand. So he would use black powder or gunpowder, a fuse, a bit of paper, some fine dust. Then he would use this rod, which is called a stamper. And mm -hmm. as you can well see, it is made out of brass. Mm -hmm. He had to stamp everything down tightly into the hole. Mm -hmm. But if he used any other kind of instrument, it would cause a spark. Early Victorian mining conditions have been recreated in these caverns. In the slate mill, the slate splitter splits solid rock into thin sheets before cutting it down to size. A trip down the deep mine is also possible with a special inclined railway taking passengers 400 feet below the surface. May 
I welcome you then to the deep mine and say that for the next 25 minutes or so, you'll be going on a journey through these chambers by yourselves. Back on the surface and high above the town, the scenery is as beautiful as ever. The area's modern-day industry is reflected in the nuclear power station at Transfinid. The station is dwarfed by the landscape. The water of Klinstulen provides the power for the hydroelectric pump power station at Tani Gritsjau. The station was opened in 1963 and has a centre for visitors. The narrow gauge for Stinyuk Railway runs past the power station. Here, one of the line's famous Donald Fairley locomotives steams up towards Fustinyog. In Fustinyog station, preparations are underway for the nine-mile journey to Porthmanok. The Fustinyog railway is the best known of all the narrow-gauge railways in Wales. It was built in 1835 to take slate from the quarries down to the coast. The decline of the slate industry led to its closure in the 1950s. It has since been resurrected and reopened to serve the region's new industry. Tourism. The approach to Porth Maddock is along the mile-long causeway called the Cobb. Built in 1811 to hold back the sea across the Glaslyn estuary, the Cobb enabled thousands of acres of land to be reclaimed and turned into fertile farmland. Porth Maddock is still a busy town and a tourist and yachting centre. But in the past, Porth Maddock was more famous for its fast sailing schooners. Its shipbuilding heyday was in the mid-19th century. And especially well known were the two and three masted schooners which carried Welsh slate all over the world. The Maritime Museum still tells the story, but today the ships in the harbour are of a different kind. The pace is gentle and relaxed, and it doesn't matter if a small inflatable is all you have under your command. The area appeals to land lovers as well, with a wide panorama of mountains behind the Glaslyn River. From here, it's worth making a detour to Cricketh on the Clint Peninsula. The town is only a short train ride away. Cricketh faces south and the views out over Cardigan Bay are unrivaled. On a clear day, the whole northwest coast is visible. Above the bay stands the castle. Like all the large castles along this coast, it was built by the English to hold down the Welsh. Just over a mile away is the village of Clanistumdui, famous as the birthplace of David Lloyd George. 
The gardens of his home at Brynja Wecklen are open now to visitors. The Duifau River runs through the village and it's not hard to see why, after a lifetime in politics, the famous statesman wanted to come home to his village at the end of his life. We now return to the Festinio Railway for a short trip to Minford and nearby Port Merion. Port Merion is a fairy tale village set on cliffs above the shores of Cardigan Bay. This unique architectural creation, surrounded by hanging woods and subtropical gardens, was created by the architect Sir Clough William Ellis between 1925 and 1975. The village was inspired by Portofino and is often described as Italianate but the true style of the village is far more personal. It's a haven for buildings that were in danger of perishing elsewhere. They were taken down, moved and re-erected at Port Merion, and other bits and pieces were used if they fitted in. Clough Williams Ellis wanted to show that one could develop even a very beautiful site without defiling it, and to awaken in people an interest in architecture, landscape and design. Anyone who visits Port Merion will agree that he has succeeded. We now rejoin British Rail and head south to Harlech. Here, the wide expanse of beach is backed by rolling sand dunes and rich farmland. The station at Harlech is dominated by the castle, which stands high above the town on a steep cliff. Castle was started by Edward I in 1283 as another link in the defensive chain to retain control of his newly won lands. Despite its impressive strength and position, the castle was successfully besieged and captured in 1404 by Owain Glyndar in his Welsh rebellion against Henry IV. But today it's in the safe hands of Welsh heritage.
leaving Harlech, we continue south along the coast through San Bedro and Dufferin Ardudari. Overlooking a magnificent sweep of beach, the tiny village of Llan Bera remains largely untouched by modern times. Evidence of the area's earliest inhabitants can still be found along this coast. At Dufrin Adudawi, this impressive Neolithic chambered tomb has stood silent witness to over 4,000 years of history. It's well worth making the time for a short detour up the river Maudach to Coedi Brennan, where the easiest way to see the forest is by bike. At the moment, there's four different routes marked out in the forest, ranging from, I think, an hour for the shortest up to about three hours. We supply helmets, safety helmets with the bikes and a toolkit as well. And in the visitor itself, visitor centre itself, there's, um, there's a tea room and there's uh, craft a craft shop, yeah. there's a sign unit, there's plenty of things for people to do. There's an adventure playground for the kids as yeah. well, that are too young to go on the bikes. So it's quite a good centre, really. And plenty to see, there's old gold mines, yeah, waterfalls. Yeah, waterfalls, and rivers to go swimming in. So. Returning to the coast, our next stop is at the popular holiday town of Barmouth. Here, above the waterfront, a fine cluster of tall 18th and 19th century houses look down on the long sandy beach. Across this beautiful estuary, you see Carda Idris. Not as high as Snowdon, yet it more than makes up for lack of height by its sheer grandeur. From Barmouth's busy harbour, another break from British Rail. We take the ferry across the River Mouthach to Fairborn. Once on the other side of the river, there's time for a ride on the Fairborn Light Railway. From the station at Fairborn, the line runs alongside the road before sweeping out across the sand dunes to its terminus in the Mauda history. To celebrate its centenary, this railway designed and built its own locomotive. We, we had this dream of building the ultimate locomotive, one which wouldn't break down, uh, one which would keep on running, would be economical and easy to maintain. is certainly the most powerful minimum gauge engine ever built in the world. Rejoining British Rail, the line now runs through tiny villages perched high above the cliffs. 
Here, at Klangeek Linen, an ancient church looks out to sea where boats cast their nets for fish. Further south at Tawin, the Taraklin Railway heads up into the hills towards Abergenolwyn. Like the Fistinog, this railway was built to carry slate down to the sea and was the first line to be rescued from closure by railway preservation enthusiasts. The scenery here is breathtaking as the railway winds its way up the valley to the tiny station of Epigonol. Beyond Aberganolwyn, the line extends to its terminus, the forest halt of Nant Gwernal, where the quiet and peaceful valley with woods and waterfalls is perfect for forest walks. From the Tanaklin Railway, the BR Sprinter sets off again, leaving the resort of Tawin behind. Our next stop is Aberduffy, a delightful Victorian seaside resort, which has retained an atmosphere of charm, quiet relaxation and tranquility. Cottages nestle above the sea, boats bob gently at their moorings, and even the gulls seem contented. Here, on the beach, you can while away the afternoon. Turning inland, we soon arrive in McCuntleth, an old market town serving the needs of a wide area. The town is the site of Owain Glendower's 1404 Parliament, and the Parliament House, made from small split stones, is a rare example of a late medieval Welsh townhouse. But McCamcliff has more to offer than history, as a visit to any of its many restaurants and cafes will testify. Not far away is the Centre for Alternative Technology, where a unique water-powered cliff railway will take you to a wooded landscape full of fascinating displays. The Centre for Alternative Technology has been, for the last 18, 19 years, promoting the use of technologies which are sustainable, um, which means that they don't damage the environment that we all depend on. So we're talking about things like wind power, solar power, water power, organic gardening and recycling. And all of those things you can see people living and working with those technologies, the, problem, the, the solutions to our environmental problems are all here to be seen at the Centre for Alternative Technology. Amongst the trees, almost every type of alternative power is generated, supplied by the wind, the sun and by water.
There is even a do-it-yourself wave generator where your own efforts are rewarded by electric light. There are also the more traditional water wheels and there are acres of organic display gardens to explore. Animals also thrive here, protected from the intensive farming that they'd receive outside. Rejoining the train, our journey now takes us through the forests of Mid Wales and back to the coast passing the long viaduct at Davy Junction on the way. Almost at the end of our journey, there's an impressive water wheel at Duffy Furnace. The train soon pulls into the isolated seaside resort of Aberystwyth. An electric cliff railway climbs high above the town to Constitution Hill. As we ascend, the commanding views over Cardigan Bay are slowly revealed. The town lies between two headlands and has an air of permanence and stability with its royal pier and fine old buildings. Aberystwyth is also the starting point of the Vale of Rydal Railway. The railway provides a 12-mile journey by narrow-gauge steam train through picturesque wooded glens and wide green valleys. It was built to serve the lead, copper and silver mines on which the prosperity of the area depended. Today, it carries only tourists. As the train pulls out of Aberystwyth, let's reflect on what has passed. A journey which has left us with an unforgettable image of this beautiful part of Britain.